Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to begin a new study in the epistle to the Galatians, verse by verse. Our Father and our God, we just come into your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege and the opportunity we have to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit take this time and filter out the air sealing to the, the truth to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The epistle to the Galatians is a wonderful epistle. I think what you're going to find out is it's a little bit different than... Uh, uh, other epistles and so I only have just a few introductory remarks any of you who have studied the literature on the epistle to the Galatians will find a lot of discussion about where that these churches are you know it was sort of like uh, North and South Carolina there was a North Galatia and a South Galatia for many hundreds of years the early Christians all believed that this epistle was addressed to churches in North Galatia, which would today would be modern Turkey. Uh, that pretty much changed. Uh, and its capital, you know, Ankara today, that's the capital of modern Turkey. That puts us in that geographical region. Now, I think the normal opinion today is it's addressed to churches in South Galatia. It's the only epistle that is not addressed to any particular church. You'll note that the word church in the second verse is plural. So apparently there were a number of churches in this Galatian er uh, location, this geographical area. Whether it was South Galatia or North Galatia, I don't much care. And I'm not of the opinion that you, you need to know that in order to understand the epistle. So that's the first point that I'd like to make. Second point I'd like to make is that the author is the Holy Spirit. I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit used Paul to pen this letter. But I also have no doubt but that the Holy Spirit is the author. The purpose of this epistle is to underscore the Word of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. There have always been, always been, two principal attacks against the finished work of Christ. The first one is to add something to it. You know, you must be circumcised, uh, baptized, uh, any number of things. You know, be a member of a church or, or some other law requirement to ensure your redemption. And the other attack has always been to delete something. You know, the deity of Christ, the uh, author authority of the scriptures, and both of those have been used very effectively by Satan in his war against the body of Christ to delete something from biblical doctrine. The deity of Christ is a good example. I think that the majority of those who claim to be Christian today do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. I believe God, by His sovereign design, engineered, not permitted, but engineered a battle against the churches in Galatia for the addition of requirements other than faith in Christ. And He did that in order that the Holy Spirit might use the Apostle Paul to pen this epistle to defend in a magnificent way the biblical doctrine of the finished work of Jesus Christ and our redemption totally separate from any work. So with that in much in view and remembering that the author is the Holy Spirit, we'll begin to look at the epistle verse by verse. Paul, an apostle, not by men, neither by man, but by, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That's the first verse. 
Now there are three prepositions in this verse and the Holy Spirit chooses them very carefully. Paul, an apostle, not. Okay, it, it's absolutely not. It's the strongest not in the Greek. In no way is he from men. And the word from is apo. The preposition is apo, away from. He's not from some committee, some group of elders, some church who commissioned him to go and to address the Galatian churches. That's not his source of authority. Neither by means of men, plural. He's not out from men or, or he's not from men. He's not sent by men. You know, he's not sent by some committee, by some group, by some elders in some fellowship who commissioned him to go and preach the gospel. Neither is he by means of a man. The, the high priest, for example, or, or some instructor who taught him and educated him, uh, like Gamaliel, uh, in the truths that he's about to discuss. But he's by means of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Okay, I want you to put those together. Uh, there's not two prepositions there. It does not say by means of Jesus Christ and, and by means of God the Father. It says by means of Jesus Christ and God the Father as though that's one expression. Now, it is, I admit, it's not an overwhelming expression of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is a consistent indication in the Word of God of the deity of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about the Apostle Paul, and, and we'll see that as we study this chapter, he was dedicated in his service for God. He thought that it was service for God. And when they preached Jesus Christ as an effective sacrifice, he, the Apostle Paul, was out to destroy that. And when we end the chapter, we'll find that they, they only heard that he which persecuted the church in time past now preaches the faith which once he sought to destroy. And that's what he did. That's what he did. Now, if you look at the other apostles, and, I, and I'm not going to get into any big discussion as to whether they were apostles to the church or, or, or to the Jews, it is clear in the Word of God that the outstanding apostle to the Gentiles was Paul. But if you look at the other apostles, they were all called by Jesus Christ. He walked by the sea uh, and he said, follow me. And immediately they left their nets, their fishing nets, and they followed him. They were commissioned. At least Peter was commissioned at the Sea of Galilee in the last chapter of the book of John by the risen Christ, but it was the risen Christ in earthly manifestation. He was there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. He toasted bread and he cooked fish. And as you know, they, they had fellowship together. And Peter, who had just vehemently denied him just a week or so before, was clearly reinstated as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So every one of those apostles could claim a commission by Jesus Christ as Paul could, but all of them with, with Christ incarnate in human flesh. Even after his resurrection, he appeared to them in the flesh as a man. But not Paul. Not Paul. Paul says that Christ appeared to him as one born out of due, due season. And you'll remember the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Paul, it was on the road to Damascus. This is not only the risen Christ, but this is the Christ of glory. This is Christ in heaven. And there's every indication in Scripture that those, uh, or even though those with Paul did not see him, Paul did. And his commission came directly from heaven, from the risen Christ in his glory, not Christ in his humanity. So he's an apostle by means of 
Jesus Christ and God the Father. And the expression Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, as one idiomatic expression is an indication that Paul by the Holy Spirit is referring to his commission from the heavenly Christ not as the other apostles. And this makes him a rather unique apostle. He's different than the rest. From the time of the apostles downward, those who have preached the gospel and taught the word have normally been accepted and approved by a body of believers. There has been on many occasions those who profess to be messengers of Christ and nobody accepted their authority. Nobody commissioned them. They just felt called to do it. A true minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ has had an encounter with the risen Christ. And Paul is said to be an example to all of those who would hereafter believe. And all the brethren are there with me. So Paul is being led by the Holy Spirit to point out that his commission, his apostleship, and, and the word apostolo means to be sent, representing the sender, uh, emphasizes the message that you're carrying. Apostolo emphasizes the one who sent you. So Paul is being sent by Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and glorified on high. And so the expression Jesus Christ and God the Father, I believe, is an incidental indication of that risen Christ whom God raised from the dead. Now, you can get indications in the Word of God that Christ raised Himself. The Holy Spirit raised Him and God the Father raised Him. But by far and away, by far and away, the scriptural declaration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is almighty and eternal God in His deity, raising Jesus Christ in His humanity. He literally rose from the dead as man. And at this moment, at, right now, at this moment, there is a man in heaven. A God-man sitting on the throne. And so the argument here or the revelation is that his apostleship is by means of Jesus Christ and God the Father based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ and every epistle and the preaching of the gospel that we hold dear is based on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The overwhelming reason for basing our doctrine on the resurrection of Christ is because it is the seal, the stamp of, of approval that the price that he paid was sufficient. If he hadn't paid enough, he'd still be dead. And so who raised him from the dead is the testimony that what Jesus Christ did in the flesh was sufficient. And it's the all-sufficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that underlies this entire epistle. South Galatia, North Galatia, I, I don't know where it was. We don't know what church this is. We know it's several churches, but it is. it would be error to add Sabbath keeping, water baptism, circumcision, church membership, church attendance, missionary giving, tithing, you name it, to, to add something to the sufficiency of the finished work of Jesus Christ. The thing that underlies this epistle that we're about to study is the finished work of Christ. The great argument in the church is to add to that and we draw a fine line between legalism and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a huge difference in doing something for Christ because you love Him and doing something for Christ to ensure your trip to heaven. The, the equation, if you, if you was to write it on a chalkboard, would be eternal life, 
equals Christ plus nothing else. Uh, today, there's a lot of minuses. You know, the, the deity of Christ, the authority of the scriptures, and, and so forth. But in Galatia, we're dealing with those who are adding to the finished work of Christ. And that's the subject of our study here. So we have eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus. Okay, now if that's true, then the finished work of Jesus Christ has been reduced to nothing. Do not make the Galatian error of believing that eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus whatever you can come up with, whatever water baptism, you know. Then, then what if you aren't bat water baptized? Well, you go to hell. So to what avail was the finished work of Christ? That's, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You, you reduce the finished work of Christ to zero. Any plus that you put in the equation reduces the finished work of Christ to zero. If you take the equation, eternal life equals the finished work of Christ plus something else, it, folks, it doesn't jive dimensionally, okay? Raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. That's the all-sufficiency. That's the undergirding principle of this entire epistle. And all the brethren, it says, all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. This is not something I made up, says Paul. This is not something where I stand alone. The Holy Spirit is having Paul say that. What he is saying is what all the brethren ought to say and in fact do say. All of those who are with me and the Holy Spirit say the same thing. That's what the verse says. All the brethren which are with me unto the churches, plural, of Galatia. So you, you people at Galatia can't argue. You, you cannot argue that the Holy Spirit only has Paul say this because everyone with Paul says it too. And they're writing to the churches, plural, of Galatia. Now I don't know whether those are are Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and, and so on and so forth, but I believe very strongly that the reason that the Holy Spirit has not made it clear who these actual churches were is because there is an element of this error in every church. It's just too amazing to the human mind to believe that we do nothing to be redeemed. There just has to be something that involves our effort and our will if we're to be redeemed. We have verses of Scripture like, you know, you know, I, I, you know everything worth having is worth working for. That's, that, that's what my dad said. Now, I never could find that verse. And, and folks, from a human standpoint, that may well be true, but when we carry it over into a different dimension, it doesn't check dimensionally. We were not obligated to secure our redemption somehow because we were totally depraved. All the brethren which are with me are sending a resounding message to the churches of Galatia. And I believe to some degree, to some degree, every Christian church has been infiltrated with a doctrine of adding to the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why it's the offense of the cross. That's where the Jew had such great difficulty. Apparently, even in Peter's mind, after years with Jesus Christ, when he disputed with Paul, apparently, in Peter's mind, there was the insidious idea you know, that he ought to rest in Christ and keep the law. That he shouldn't eat with a Gentile. And so that problem, both the problem of sub subtracting uh, from and, and adding to the Word of God, has been prevalent in the Christian church since Christ Jesus ascended into heaven. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that's got to sound familiar to you. Now, that's not the end of a sentence, and, and the marvelous conclusion of that sentence will be the next two verses. But let's just stop for just a moment, okay? Let's, let's stop for just a moment here. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look back at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? Verse 4, declared to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. Okay? All right? We have the same claim for the resurrection that we have in Galatians, but to all that, that be in Rome... And verse 7, beloved of God called saints. All right, now let's go to 1 Corinthians. Boy, I mean, if there ever was a messy church, it's Corinthians. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ by means of the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are set apart in Christ Jesus called saints. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. All right. Now let's go to Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Okay. Let's go to Philippians. Paul and Timotheus, Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. All right, now let's go to Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and, and so forth. And I won't go on. Dearly beloved, every epistle is addressed to a definite group of people called saints. Where are the saints in Galatians? Where are they at? Now listen to me. I am not saying that there's not saints in Galatia who gave himself for our sins, says the text, but there isn't any direct addressed to a specific church and there isn't any indication that this is addressed to the saints which were are at Galatia. Now I am not in any way suggesting that there aren't there weren't saints there. But I am suggesting how muddy the picture is when you add law to grace, when you add requirements to the finished work of Jesus Christ. The saints are there. But folks, they do not appear in the text, only a foggy view, a muddy view, muddy view. You can see saints here, he gave himself for our sins, but there isn't any specific reference to a body of believers loved by God and secure in Christ. Every other epistle is different. In that sense, this epistle Galatians is unique because it addresses a serious problem. Do the churches imply the saints? Well, sure. The church could be an assembly of people, whether they're believers or not, saints or, or not saints. I think saints are implied. 
Look at verse 4. Who gave Himself for our sins. It's implied there. I am simply pointing out it is a foggy picture. It doesn't say to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Galatia, but all the other epistles do. Sure, I believe saints are there. Absolutely. But folks, the picture is foggy. Who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and our Father. He didn't give Himself because you wanted Him to. He didn't give Himself because you asked Him to. He didn't give Himself because you expected Him to. The whole thing was the designed plan of God and He gave Himself for our sins, not for everyone's sins, for our sins. And the question that the Galatians must answer is, was what Christ did sufficient? And I think that's the question we all have to ask. So we kicked off this study in Galatians. I hope that you really are blessed by it. Know that, that we love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. For it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all things for it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.